Whitey Ford played for the New York Yankees from 1950 until 1967. He was a left-handed pitcher whose lifetime winning percentage was 690. He played in 11 World Series games, and in 1961, he won 25 games and received the prestigious Cy Young Award. In 1974, along with teammate and good friend Mickey Mantle, he was elected into the Hall of Fame. Whitey Ford was born and raised in New York and has lived on Long Island since 1952. At his home on a typical Long Island summer day, I talked with Whitey Ford about his baseball career and about living on Long Island. Why do you think that the game of baseball has increased in popularity over the years? Well, I think, um, first of all, you have 26 teams now, surely, in Major League Baseball. 14 in the American League, 12 in the National. Years ago, there was only 16, eight in each league. Now you have teams out in the West Coast, which we never had until, you know, 20, 25 years ago. So the people in the West Coast, up in Seattle, uh, they're all getting interested in baseball, up in Toronto, Montreal. So I think more people in the United States are interested in baseball than those 16 towns we had before. In fact, there weren't even 16 towns because the Yankees at one time had three, you know, I mean, the, not the Yankees, but New York had three teams at one time. Uh, Philadelphia had two, St. Louis had two, so really it was only about 10 or 12 towns that had baseball years ago, so I think more people have seen it now, and uh, like you said, it's getting more popular every day. In all the World Series that you played in, which one was the most memorable? I guess uh, probably 1961, surely. Uh, I'd played in many before that, but 61 was a year that Roger Maris hit 61 home runs. Mm -hmm. The Yankees broke the record for home runs by a team. I think they hit 240. Uh, it was Ralph Houck's first year as a manager. I had my best year. I won 25 games. And I never was much for records or keeping track of, you know, what was my most important game. But this particular World Series, I broke Babe Ruth's record for consecutive scoreless innings. It was a best kept secret I ever heard because I never knew that Babe Ruth was a pitcher until that World Series and then one of the writers told me that Babe Ruth had pitched 29 innings of, in World Series and not given up a run and all of a sudden in the second game and that I pitched in Cincinnati uh, I broke the record and like I said it was a well kept secret but I, I was kind of proud of that record uh, but I, like I said I wasn't too, too interested in other records. Mm -hmm. well, what about that 1961, the Roger Maris and Mickey Mantle home run contest? Well, it was probably the most exciting thing that's ever happened to me. What, you know, as a, I was more like a fan that year. Uh, I mean, I'd, I'd go out and pitch every fourth day, and I, you know, and I had a, like I said, I had a good year. But just watching Mickey and and then uh, Roger in this home run contest all year, and then a few weeks before the season ended. Uh, uh, Mickey got hurt. Mm -hmm. uh, some doctor had given him a shot in the backside and he got infected. And so Mickey really lost, uh, you know, eight or ten games at the end of the season. So, but I was so proud of Roger. He went ahead and hit the 61 home runs and broke uh, uh, Babe Ruth's record. And I just didn't think he got the notoriety that he should have gotten because the, the writers in those days, uh, they didn't like Roger for some reason. They tried to make him look like a bad guy. He was but shy, wasn't he? He, he was shy, yeah. and, and the players loved him. And that's the tip off when your teammates like you, you know, everybody should know that, then you're a good guy. But what Roger put up with the, week, it's the last two weeks of the season, there were times where we'd have 100, 150 writers in the dressing room at one time. And how Roger put up with it, asking, answering the same questions day after day, uh, that's the one thing I remember about that season. Yeah. How about the 1961 All-Star Game out in San Francisco? Uh, a little golf contest? A little well, golfing that's outing? a funny story, yes. Uh, it was the All-Star Game in San Francisco, right? I gotta, you know, think about that. Well, we were in Chicago the day, uh, on Sunday, and the All-Star Game was Tuesday, and Mickey Mantle and I wanted to play golf in Frisco on Monday, this was an off day. I called Horace Stone, the owner of the Giants, who was the only one I knew, and I said, Horace, Mickey and I would like to play golf tomorrow in Frisco, and he says, you you just get to San Francisco and my son Pete will pick you up. Sure enough, we go out to uh, the uh, the Olympic Club, the Olympic Golf Club in San Francisco. Mm -hmm. I think they had the open there years ago. It's a very famous golf course. And we got there, we didn't have nothing. We didn't have no shoes, uh, gloves, uh, 
So we started buying things. We bought alpaca sweaters and a cap and <laughs> shoes and the green fees. And we must have set, uh, spent about three or four hundred dollars. But we didn't spend it. We just kept signing Horace Stoneham's name to everything. <laughs> well, that night uh, it happened at Tut Shore, a restaurateur from New York was out there and he had a party and he was a good friend of Horace's. So he invited Mickey and I and Horace came. And I went over to Horace during the party and I said, Horace, here's $400 Mickey and I owe you mm -hmm. from this afternoon. You know, we signed for everything. He says, he thought for a second and he said, I'll tell you what, Whitey, if you get Willie Mays out in the All-Star game tomorrow, and I didn't even know if I was going to be pitching because they <laughs> hadn't announced the pitches yet. If you get Willie Mays out, we'll call it even. If he gets a hit off of you, you give me $800. Uh -oh. <laughs> so I said, okay, but then I went back and told Mickey, and Mickey wouldn't go along with it because he knew Willie Mays was like, nine for 20 off of me lifetime. I mean, Willie could really hit me well. So finally, I got a couple of beers in Mickey and he changed his mind and I went back and I says, that's a deal, Horace. Sure enough, we wake up the next morning and I get the paper and it's headlines, man, uh, Ford uh, versus Warren Spahn. Right. So all I can think about is this bet. And well, Mickey's out in center field and all he can think about is the bet with Horace. So I get the first two batters out and uh, Roberto Clemente hits a double. And up comes Willie, and like I said, all I'm thinking about is the $800 or nothing. So I get two strikes on him. When, when I say strikes, he hit two foul balls down the left field line, must have went 500 feet. Uh -uh. That's how good he hit. <laughs> but now I got two strikes on him. And I said, this isn't really an official game. It's a, you know, it's like an exhibition game. I'm gonna throw a spitball to him. <laughs> so I wet the ball up, and it, this ball starts right at Willie's shoulder. He's right-handed, and it starts right in here, and a spitball acts in funny ways. Well, this one happened to come at Willie and then just drop down over the plate. And Willie jumped back. He thought he was going to hit him. The umpire says, strike three. The inning's <laughs> over. Well, I'm so relieved. And I'm walking by. Willie, st Willie had jumped back and fell down. He thought the ball was going to hit him. I'm walking by. Willie's still laying on the ground, you know, looking at me. And he says, what's that crazy guy in center field doing clapping his hands? Here's Mickey coming in from center field, <laughs> clapping his hands. And uh, I, I turned around and I said, Willie, we'll explain it to you after the game. And then we told him after the game that we saved ourselves $800 by getting Willie out. And it was a funny story. Yeah, oh, that was an exciting day. You know, I want to play a little word, baseball word association. Um, and I want you to tell me who comes to mind. Power hitter. Mickey Mantle. Bunter. Uh, <laughs> I could say Mickey Mantle again. Phil Rizzuto. Yeah. Yeah, he was the best, one of the best right-handed bunters I've ever seen. Yeah. Uh, most serious player. Uh, Tony Kub. It was a tie between Tony Kubek and Bobby Richardson. Mm -hmm. uh, shortstop and second baseman. They were very, very serious fellows. And who was like the clown? Funniest. Um, the funniest. Uh, well, we had. I guess probably Joe Pepitone. Yeah, Joe Pepitone was probably the funniest. He was a clown. He didn't take, if he'd taken baseball ser more serious, I think mm. he'd still be playing. Uh, the toughest pitcher, other, you know, obviously other than himself. The best pitcher I've ever seen in my life was Sandy Koufax. Mm -hmm. uh, I think Bob Gibson would be it. I'm just talking about, mm -hmm. you know, I'd really, I played against him in World Series. I never hit against Bob Gibson, but I pitched two games against Sandy in the 63 World Series. I didn't make out too good. We lost four <laughs> straight. But he was the best pitcher I think I've ever seen for those five years he was out in Los Angeles. And the toughest batter that... The uh, best hitter I've ever seen, yeah. Shirley, was Ted Williams. But for some reason, I didn't have that much trouble with him. I mean, he got hits off me, but mm -hmm. I mean, he hit nowhere near his lifetime batting average off me. Nellie Fox was a little second baseman with the Chicago White Sox, drove me crazy. <laughs> he just tried to hit the ball through the infield, over the infielder's head, never tried for a home run. He and Harvey Keene, who was the same kind of hitter, but he was right-handed. Harvey played shortstop for the Detroit Tigers. Those two gave me more trouble than any hitters in baseball. <laughs> and best friend? Oh, my best friend, uh, I mean, besides my wife. <laughs> uh, in baseball. I guess. Uh, 
I have three of them. <laughs> I don't want to be a name dropper. <laughs> oh, okay. But, uh, I think Billy uh, Martin and uh, Yogi and Mickey and I, we've, we've known each other since 1950, and we've... Uh, it's pretty nice when you stay friends with guys for 37 years. I know Mickey writes a wonderful introduction to the new book. Yeah, that I read just that. Came I, out. I didn't know he wrote that. <laughs> Phil Peppy, the writer, put that in. I, was, I almost cried when I read it. Yes, yes. It Except is very. He said he loved me. I got a little <laughs> nervous. <laughs> it's very moving and wonderful. Uh, the book has a, a title called Slick, and it was a nickname? Well, what happened. Uh, when I joined the Yankees, you know, and I got to hanging around with Billy and Mickey, they found out that I was born in New York City on the east side, East 66th Street to be exact, and um, they heard the word City Slicker, so they, uh, Billy started calling me Slick, was Slicker, and then Mickey started calling me Slick, and to this day they both call me Slick. It's a funny thing, but uh, it stuck with me, and they're probably, the only, they're probably the only two that call me Slick. Okay. You have a few other nicknames? Uh, well, chairman well, of the board. Chair well, that's something <laughs> Elston Howard uh, uh, put on me when he was used to catch me. Uh, he thought, I think he really said it. I asked him once why he did that, and he said, well, you, you look like you're so in charge of everything when you're out on the mound pitching that I decided to call you the chairman of the board. So you were not a nervous player then. It was no. you're very confident. I was. I was a little cocky, uh, and even if I was nervous, I... I just had a way, I think, out of the mound where I, the other opposing players didn't think I was nervous, even though I might have been nervous. One of the things um, that I've heard is that you had the greatest pickoff move, and how did you develop it? Well, in 1955, uh, we, we went to Japan, uh, the Yankees, and we played 30 games in Japan and in the Philippines. And I started practicing over there because the Japanese players were just starting to get fairly good. They weren't very good players in those days. They were like equivalent to maybe our low minor leagues or medium minor leagues. And I just kept practicing over there because every time a man get on, I, I always felt that even if I threw it wild to first and they went to second, I could probably strike the next hitter out. You know, they weren't that good a hitter in those days. And I just kept practicing over in Japan. Every game I pitched, I'd throw over to first, I'd pick or, uh, try pick off at second. And in 1956, when I came back, I must have picked off 15 or 20 players that next year mm -hmm. from practicing it. And then after that, I didn't pick many off, but that was because everybody in the league knew I had a reputation of having a good pickoff move so that they wouldn't take a big lead off the first, which also helped me because sure. they didn't steal much. <laughs> they didn't go from sure. first to third on a single, so it, it always did help me after that. Mm. Do you um, remember how you felt at the moment that you heard you had made the Hall of Fame? I was sitting right in that room over there in this house, <laughs> and I was shooting. Uh, at that time, there was a, we had a pool table in that room. It's our, it's my office actually now. And uh, Jack Lang, uh, who now works with the New York News, was with the um, Long Island Star Journal. It was in January of 1974. He called, and I was shooting pool with my wife Joan, and he called and said. Slick. <laughs> Even some of the writers had called me Slick. He said, Slick, I got some good news for you. And I knew right away then. So uh, he says, you made it. And he told me by, you know, enough votes. And in fact, I had missed by 20 or 30 votes a year before. And he says, now the real good news is Mickey Mantle got in with you. And I said, I, I think a tear or two came down my eyes. <laughs> it was a very touching moment. And it was an interesting experience. Your entire family was able to go up to the ceremony and... Oh yes, my my um, my daughter had gotten married the week before. Yeah, it was July of '74, right? Sally Ann had got married the week before. I thought I was nervous walking her down the aisle, <laughs> but then I had to get up and speak in Cooperstown, you know, make the acceptance speech, and that was one of the toughest things I've ever had to do. There's like 15 or 20,000 people out there all cheering for Mickey, you know, oh. and you try and be humorous, but it it was uh, it was one of the toughest things I had to do. Oh, it's a wonderful moment. Uh, speaking about Sally Ann and the other children, you've been out here on Long Island and you raised your children on Long Island? We moved to this house um, 1959, 29 years we've been here in Lake Success and we love it. The schools are great, 
uh, you know, we've got the Olympic pool, size swimming pool, and the, all the little league fields, and a great golf course. It's just a wonderful place to live, and, and the school school system was so great, so it's just been a great place to... Uh, Your children to, were both in the public and the, and the parochial schools? Yes, uh, Eddie went to Great Neck South, and Sally Ann and Tommy went to St. Mary's. But before that, they went over here to Lakeville School. And, oh, yeah. Uh, yeah My kids are over there grade. now, too. They sure. went there to the sixth grade, and then they went down to St. Anastasia's. And uh, it's, they just got a wonderful education, and uh, it's just a nice neighborhood. What really. brought you to this area, though? I looked at this house in 1952 when I got out of the Army in November of 52. It was Jones, a new neighborhood then, right? It was, it was just it, this was yeah. the model house. Yeah. And they were... I hate to tell you the price, they were $32,000. Oh, no. Oh, no. And, and I just got out of the Army. I was dead broke. I didn't have a penny. Uh, and I knew I'd re have some money because I was going to rejoin the Yankees in 1953. See, I, I played in 1950, then went in the Army for 51 and 2. So, 53, I came back. And Joan and I looked at this house in November of 52, right after I got out of the Army. And I said, there's no way we can swing the $32,000. Oh, and we went out to Glen Cove and got a, I think the house out there was only 19000 oh. It sounds crazy after the prices nowadays. Sure. And five years, five years later, people that lived right across from you, uh, Petropolis, Pete Petropolis and his wife Gloria. Pete's been my friend since I'm 15 years old. They were from Astoria. He called me in Glen Cove. Now, this is 1958, and I have some money. <laughs> he calls me, he says, Whitey, there's a sign on that house that you liked five years ago, right on the lawn. They, you know, they don't do that anymore. But there was a, a sign on the lawn. The guy had just put it on the lawn, and an hour later, I'm over here, and I bought the same house back that I had looked at five years. It was meant to be. Right. And it really wasn't that much more, and it was a... Plus, living in Glen Cove, it was just too long a trip to, to Yankee Stadium, and you know, here it's a breeze. It's like 16 miles to Yankee Stadium, and uh, it was one, the best move I ever made coming here. And you and you've been here now for 20, a while. 29 years. Did you take the children with you when you went to spring training and traveled on road trips? Yes, we. Uh, the kids outside of uh, Sally Ann's, the oldest. Uh, she in '53 she didn't come with Joan, but from 1954 on, the kids came to every spring training, you know, right up until I, almost till I quit baseball. And uh, we had the, the teachers here in Great Neck would give them their work for three months ahead. Oh, and it worked terrific. out great. We'd get a tutor or they'd go to a school down in Fort Lauderdale or St. Petersburg and they, uh, they kept up with their grades very well. Oh, now you've been out on Long Island for, over, what, 20, uh, well, what did I say, 28 years now? More than that, we, uh, we moved to, uh, well I was, I lived in Astoria growing uh -huh. up. But when I got married, we moved to Glen Cove in 1953. So I'd say we're in Nassau County since 1953. Do you have any ventures in Nassau County that you uh, are involved with on Long Island? Yes, we have. Uh, we have the Whitey Ford Batting Range over in Lindbrook, which is uh, it's an indoor baseball batting range, ba baseball and softball. There's so many softball players now that we put some softball machines in. And I enjoy that. I get over there as much as I can and hit some balls oh, myself. Oh, that's great. Yeah, and it, it's uh, it's really nice. We've had it a, uh, one year now, and it's doing well. And it's uh, my grandkids get more use out of it than I do, though. Oh, it's good they get yeah. a chance to go over. There's also a videotape that uh, my nephew, who's a beginning, uh, you know, player in the little leagues, came across w that you did with Mickey Mantle and Phil Rizzuto? Yes, we've done, right? we done that a year and a half ago. It was done in Fort Lauderdale, and um, Mickey and I and Phil Rizzuto is right. And Phil uh, teaches, you know, infield, hit, uh, playing the infield and bunting, and then Mickey talks about the outfield and hitting, and then I do the pitching part of it. So it's, 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 it's a nice film. It's yeah, the really kids good like for it. Young kids. Yes, yeah. they enjoy it. It's very yeah. good for them. And the, the book is new this year? That came out about six weeks ago. It's called Slick, and Phil Pepe, a friend of mine that mm -hmm. writes for the Daily News. Sure. Uh, I've known Phil since 1961, and he knows me pretty well, and I, I really think he did a nice job. Oh. Uh, I was very it's, happy with the book. It's an excellent book. It has wonderful stories and, and photographs. It's one of the <laughs> oh, a good friend of mine that just passed away, Jackie Gleason. Uh, we played... Uh, I stayed with him for two weeks down in Doral many years ago, oh. and we played golf every day. And I, uh, that was a sad thing when we lost Jackie a few weeks ago. There's also uh, a picture here of you and Billy Martin and Mickey Mantle. Yeah, that was when Billy was uh, 
a scout for the Minnesota Twins. He visited us in St. Pete. This is my favorite picture, Shirley. Yeah. This was General Douglas MacArthur's 65th birthday party. That was taken at the Waldorf Astoria, and uh, it's one of my favorite pictures. There's so many children today who are, you know, they have always the dream of a major league career, but, you know, even just today, just to learn the game of baseball, what would your advice be to them? Well, for the young boys that are just starting, you know, seven, eight years old, and they play t-ball or the coaches mm -hmm. pitch to them, uh, I, one of my, I have a six-year-old grandson, he's just getting into that. And I just advise them, I, I mean, I'll give you an example, I have my two, uh, two grandsons are seven and ten and they both play baseball in secret. And I just advise them to play as much as they can, even play when there's no game uh, booked up. You know, just go out and play with your friends in the street, and hit balls, even if it's a tennis ball, and play as many positions as you can. If the coach wants you to catch, catch. If uh, he wants you to pitch, I don't like kids pitching when they're seven or eight years old. I think they should be like maybe 14 or 15 before they start pitching because their arms aren't developed. But I, I always tell the kids, get, play as many positions as you can, and then maybe when you hit 12 or 13 or 14, you'll decide which one you like the best, and the coaches will know which position you play the best by then. So just play a lot. Uh, don't wait for you to have a game booked up. Just go out and play stickball or play, hit a tennis ball. Just Anything. play a, play just a lot. Playing. Why is it that so many uh, players in baseball today seem to be drafted from high school? They, you know, the other sports, basketball, football, they come out of college. Yeah, but now we're getting more and more in baseball out of college. That We really are because the colleges, some of them are playing 100 games a year, like Arizona State uh, uh, University of Miami plays over 100 games a year. Uh, my son went to the University of South Carolina and uh, ended up playing in the Boston Red Sox organization. I mean, it's almost now like playing in the minor leagues when you play with a good college team. So uh, I, I, I don't know about high school unless you're really, you know, uh, got a lot of talent. Uh, I, you know, then I say, okay, go, you know, go play professional ball. But uh, I, I'd like to see kids go to college first and let the uh, major league teams draft them out of college. Mm -hmm. Well, you're fortunate enough that after baseball, you still have many areas that you can get involved with. What about some of the other players? I mean, without that education, it must be difficult to get back exactly. into uh, uh, things. That's why I like them to go to college if they can, uh, because. Uh, such a small percentage of uh, even good college players is only a small percentage make it to the major leagues mm -hmm. and, and and plus the major league the average age a time that a major league stays in the big leagues is like four and a half years yeah. i mean you hear yeah. the you know sure. the Gidrys or myself or the Mantles playing 14 16 18 yeah. years yeah. that don't happen too often you there's hundreds and hundreds of guys that only play maybe one year in the big leagues right. and they're gone. So the average gets down to like four, four and a half years. And, and not many pe people realize that. So like you said, you the education something. comes in. Very That's the important. first thing. Yeah, definitely. If you could be the uh, pitcher coach of a fantasy team, who would be on the different positions? Uh, would, would you want like Yankee players? Oh, you know, any. Well, I think uh, of the, all the guys I play with, uh, probably my first baseman would be uh, Moose Garin. My second baseman would be Bobby Richardson and Billy Martin. Mm -hmm. uh, Tony Kubek and Phil Rizzuto would be my shortstops. And uh, Cleet Boyer and Dr. Bobby Brown, who is now the president of the American League, would be my third baseman. My catch, <laughs> my two catches would be <laughs> Yogi Berra and Elston Howard. Okay. And my outfield, I, ha I guess I'd have to go with Joe DiMaggio, who I played with one year, and um, Roger Maris, and uh, Mickey Mantle. I think I'll leave Mickey off the team. <laughs> he won't talk to me. <laughs> when you were growing up, who was your baseball idol? Joe DiMaggio. Yeah. Yeah. I've always, it's funny, uh, Shirley, I've been a Yankee fan since I knew anything about baseball when I was seven or eight years old in Astoria. Mm -hmm. And Joe DiMaggio, I couldn't wait to get the paper in the morning to see him, he hits he got, or, or unless the game was on radio, I'd listen to Mel Allen describe the game, but uh, Joe DiMaggio was my idol, and I wanted to be a hard-hitting first baseman when I was a kid. It ended up good the other way, but... Uh, <laughs> but you started pitching late, yeah, I didn't not pitch, early. I didn't pitch until I got out of high school, and that was because I really couldn't hit good enough uh, to, you know, to play baseball. Did you go to high school locally? No, I went to Manhattan High School of Aviation. 
the reason I didn't, I went to, I was going to go to Bryan High School. Right, Bryan's the neighborhood. Sure. Right, and they didn't have a baseball team that year. <laughs> and it's funny, a year later, after I went to Manhattan Aviation, Bryan did get a baseball team. So uh, after I got out of high school, in a story, all the guys I hung out with in the neighborhood all went to Bryant. Mm -hmm. So that was our baseball team. Yeah. And we had a team called the 34th Avenue Boys. We won the New York City Championship in 1946. We were 36 and 0. We never lost the game, which was quite good because we didn't have a home field, yeah. and we always played, you know, on the opposing team's field. And we won the New York City Championship, and that's where some scouts saw me pitch. Uh, the, the final game was in the old Polo Grounds, and some scouts saw me up there, and that's how the Yankees got interested in signing me. Now, for the Yankees today, do you go and uh, you coach for them, right? Pitching. Uh, what I do, I go to spring training and I work with the young pitchers down there for mm -hmm. about six weeks. See, we have about 24 pitches come to spring training, so it's too many for the regular Yankee coach to. So what I do, I'll take half for them, and he'll take half, and uh, I just work with them for about six weeks down there. But in spring training, you have a, a camp also, a fantasy camp? Well, then, after spring training ends, Mickey and I have a one-week fantasy camp. That's for men 30, 40, 50 years of age. Women? We're, yeah, we've <laughs> had two women so far, and they enjoy it. And now, in this coming November, the first two weeks in November, we have the fantasy camp uh, in Fort Lauderdale. We have two one-week camps. And Mickey and I love it because his four boys come down and work at it, my two boys. And we get we get coaches like uh, Moose Garen and Hank Bauer and Enos Slaughter, Yogi Bear is coming down for a few days. And the guys, the, the, we call them the campers. <laughs> These guys that are 30, 40, 50 <laughs> years old. And they just love it. We have so much fun down there. And it's right in Fort Lauderdale. We use the Yankee facilities there. We give everybody a Yankee uniform and a bat. Oh, we get a uniform. And oh. they get a video cassette and rings, and they take that all home with them. And I, th I, I don't remember one complaint since. And this will be the fourth year we're running it. Anybody interested? Can I give a phone number? Absolutely. If you call 212-382-1660, you call that number, and uh, our girl Wanda, who works for us, will send you a brochure. And we get a lot of fellows from Great Neck, a lot of men from Great Neck have oh, come to the oh, camp. Oh, terrific. Yeah, we've had, it's really good. I guess we've had 12 or 15 of them from Great Neck, and uh, they, have a, they have a ball now, man. Speaking of rings, I see you have a ring on. That is my 1953 World Series ring. And the reason I had... Why the 53? <laughs> I, had set, I had eight or nine or right. seven, something like that. The family all had. But this, the 53 was the year we won our fifth World Series in a row from 1949. No, has never been done in baseball. So that's my favorite. I know you're a big Yankee fan, obviously, but uh, do you ever really watch the Mets once in a while? <laughs> I do, yeah. I like, I like all sports, and especially New York teams. I'm a little mad at the Jets and the Giants for moving to oh, New Jersey. Definitely. <laughs> and, but I root for the Rangers, I root for the Islanders. I did. I still root for the Jets and the Giants, even though I'm a little mad at them. <laughs> and I root for the for the Mets too. I, I I just was brought up that way in New York. I root for all New York teams. Mm -hmm. When they have to play against each other, then I have a problem. But true, uh, you're a true New Yorker. Yeah. I hope the Mets and the Yankees play in the World Series. Then I'll root for the Yankees. Now, would it be called a Subway Series? Well, Long Island Railroad <laughs> Series or something. <laughs> It'd be wonderful. Well, I want to thank you so much. This has been a, a really an enjoyable day here and beautiful summer day on Long Island and a wonderful conversation. Well, thank you, Shirley. Now we're neighbors. Now we know each other a lot better. I'll have to come over to your backyard. <laughs> Absolutely. I thank you. I really enjoyed it. Thank you. After our talk, Whitey was gracious enough to invite us into his home to see some of his mementos. Well, Shirley, this wall here probably has three of the things I'm, I'm uh, proudest of. Uh, this is the Babe Ruth Award, which I got for being the most valuable player, I guess you'd call it, in the 1961 World Series. Um, then over here, this in uh, 1974, they retired my number. Uh, and the Yankees, uh, you know, took the uniform and enclosed it. And it just said, retired August 3rd, 1974. And this is the other one I'm very proud of. This is the Cy Young Award. This is an award they give to the pitchers, and uh, I won this at, uh, Cy Young Award in the 1961 season. So, as you can see, 1961 was a good year. So here's how it goes. You get your sign from the catcher, 
wind up, pivot, you kick, you sit, and then you just follow through. You plant that foot. The only thing I want you to remember, right at the end, I'm not going to throw the ball, but say I've released the ball. Now the batter might hit it back to me. Right? right. You don't want to get hit. So take it, you wind up, you throw the ball, and you just be ready in case that batter hits it back at you.